I've been thinking a lot lately about baptism. Especially baptism is defined by the UPC because that's the religious denomination I came from before I left religion. And I was thinking of it in terms of how God has been patiently bringing us along and very passionately, I would almost say desperately, trying to get us to see his heart and to see a basic statement of believe me, believe me. And it's kind of ironic because my teacher in that system once gave me a clue as to how that could be the case. And it was regarding the incident of uh, Balaam and Numbers. It gives an account of Balaam the prophet being approached by Balak. Balak sends men to offer Balaam to come and curse Israel. And Balaam asked the Lord if he should do this. And the Lord says no. And then Balak comes back with more promises of goodies. And Balaam goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, should I go? And I was puzzled by this because the Lord said, yes, go ahead and go. And then when he was going, the Lord took Balaam through this whole travail where an angel was presented to the, the eyes of the donkey Balaam was riding and caused the donkey to go off his path for fear of this mighty angel and crush Balaam's foot and uh, finally opened the donkey's mouth and then Balaam's eyes so he could see what was going on. And when I came to my teacher, I said, what, what did, why did the Lord do that? The Lord told him to go. And he just said, my teacher, that is, he said, well, he asked him again. The Lord had already told him not to go. And he asked him again. And I say that as a clue because you look at it from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Try to see this from God's point of view. I don't know if that's possible. I think I get it. I catch a glimpse of it. But just look at it from his point of view. He gives us everything <laughs> we are in the garden of eden utopia naked and unashamed perfect health the tree of life in the presence of our god just don't do this one thing would you just not do that one thing that's all and our nature is to do that one thing. That's a long and deep subject, so I'm not going to get totally into that, why we are that way, especially considering those two first people were made by the very hands of God, and, and yet they did that. I want to focus on the fact that he wants to be heard. He wants to be heard, I'm sure, about several things but the most important thing is just to be heard to be listened to to be believed and that's something we share with him being made in his likeness like you'll see in our videos all the time i talk about the fact that he's an individual and he was very uncompromising on this but he spent four thousand years telling us that and we decided to for the most part go on to believe that he's a they. But anyway, back to baptism. When John the Baptist came, he said, I will baptize you with water. And it was something that was already been going on 
I believe it's something like about 180 years, Jews had already been baptizing people. And uh, it was for the purposes of baptizing people into Judaism. And that's why it was so shocking that he would do that. Because in their minds, Jews don't need to be baptized. Jews are already clean. Jews are already, after all, Jews. They don't need that. But he said, you're just as unclean as anyone else. You need to be baptized. And as I said, it, it kind of his opening statement was, I baptize you with water. But, but, and this is a, the huge but, the gigantic wherefore, however, but instead, however you can put that, it, this very huge, it's dramatic, it's large, it's a turn. I do this baptism in water, but there comes one after me who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost or with fire. And that's another argument. Did he say and or or? I believe he said or. But I want to focus on that. John said, I'm, going to, I'm baptizing you with water, but this one, this one coming, is going to baptize you in his spirit. Because I know the focus is always on, well, geez, look at it. Jesus got baptized. And that's, again, that's another teaching I can't go into. It's a huge teaching why he got baptized. But you must consider the way the people there would have looked at it, how they would have received it, what it meant to them in their time, in their culture. That's important. We got to look at these things. And Jesus never baptized anyone. And in John chapter 4, it says that clearly. It says Jesus baptized more than anyone. However, Jesus himself did not baptize anyone. Because if he did, if he baptized anyone in water, that would have made of no sense John's claim about him baptizing with the Holy Ghost, with his very spirit. So we knew that there was a different baptism right from the get-go of John's ministry. John the Baptist's ministry, there's going to be a different baptism. But what does man do? We're all focused on this water thing. We're just consumed with it. We're just consumed with it. Why? Because we get to glory in our flesh when this baptism had. Can you imagine the rush they had? 3,000 people being baptized water baptized, the incredible rush they all had. They had already been doing that for years. But this is a one-time event of 3,000, I'm sure. That was very satisfying to their flesh. So God says, basically, through the prophet, that Jesus himself said, this is not something that came after Jesus. Jesus himself said, there is no greater prophet born of a woman than John the Baptist. No, think about that. He said John the Baptist was greater than Moses, than Daniel, than Ezekiel, than Isaiah, than any of them. And his opening salvo is, I'm going to baptize you in water, but the one after me is going to baptize you in his spirit. So what does man say? Man says, yeah, yeah, let's keep on baptizing in water. And like with Balaam, God says, okay, okay. Can you just imagine the frustration? I know people always want to say, oh, he's guiding and choreographing everything perfectly because he knows in advance. He's 50 steps ahead of us. He knows everything we're going to do. I ask you to consider is that may not always be true because until we do it, he doesn't really know we're going to do it because he, he, he's good. He does know. You can look at Deuteronomy. And he says, if you obey, this will happen. But when you don't, this will happen. He told them what would happen when they got a king. He said, you're going to reject me and you're going to ask for a king. 
he did know things like that. I'm not saying he didn't. And I, and I understand he provided for a savior. He, he did plan these things out. But until it happens, until it actually happens, I don't think he quite feels that rejection in that moment until it actually happens. And then the day of Pentecost comes and they actually become spiritually immersed. They actually receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist's statement is realized. Oh, we've been baptizing in water all this time. Now we've been baptized in the meaning of our Lord's name. He has actually become salvation and he has shown us this sign. We, we hear each other speaking in other languages. And what do they do? They rush down to the Jordan to start throwing people in the water. So he says, okay, okay, I can still work with you. Adam rejects him, says, okay, okay, I can work with you. Mankind totally rejects him. He baptizes them, baptizes the world, and, and he saves the, the, the eight that didn't get baptized, so to speak, that didn't get in the water. But he keeps, he keeps adjusting for our indiscretions, to put it politely, our irresponsibility, our rush to want to do things in the physical, to have things, to know things, to be things, rather than to just be in the presence of our God, to just look at him and say, oh my God, you are so good. I just want to be with you. I'll listen to you. I'll believe. Not as in, I'll obey all these commands, but just, I'll believe that you are who you say you are. You just, you're God. You just want to be with us right there in the garden. Just us, just you and us. That's all you ever wanted. And so when I look at it through that lens, I, I see how he's been guiding everything towards that, patiently suffering us as we do these things. And he clearly, he clearly said that he wanted us to be immersed in his spirit. What is his spirit? His spirit is love. A love that is proven and evidenced by his very blood that he would come here, become one of us, and die just for the purposes of us being together. And we have turned it into a ritual, a shallow carnal meaningless ritual to our satisfaction we did this because it's easy for us because we we want signs we want to see things we want a glory in our flesh and others but he patiently suffers that because he loves us because he knows the number one thing is to get his spirit in us because now once the spirit is in us it is never to leave again unlike Adam, because, because he died and rose again, because he is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, that long-suffering God, who we continually slap in the face. And I say we as in me, I know we've all done it. We've all done it. And he doesn't count our transgressions against us. He doesn't keep a ledger, a record, like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. He's not there keeping a record. He's just thinking, what do I need to do now to get my children into heaven with me? What do I need to do now? And you can argue about whether or not he had it all planned out in advance. I think he, he is an adjustable God in that sense. His character doesn't change. He doesn't learn and grow as far as wisdom goes. But the depths of the of the nonsense that we can portray against him just clumsily and sometimes intentionally, it's, it, it, I'm sure, I think it shocks him sometimes, clearly. When he destroyed the world with the flood, he was deeply, deeply hurt. And there's many instances when he walked the earth, you could see it. The most famous, of course, at Lazarus' grave. 
he was profoundly hurt at the the lack of faith we had and now he's still suffering it 2000 years later as we not only continue to do something that should have ended at Pentecost we glory in it and we argue about the right way to do it so he says okay go ahead go talk to Balak hey angels what do you think we ought to do about this one <laughs> that's you know that that's his where he sits I I think it helps to try to see it from his point of view and as just just a thought for today in Jesus name